Shalom everybody, welcome to today's edition from The Final Frontier. I'm reading from a book about incredible stories of near-death experiences written by Richard Kent and Val Fotherby. And there's um, a copy of this uh, on yeshuasquare.com that you can download for free and you can read all the near-death experiences for yourself um, and go through them yourself. So today's one is called Heaven and Hell, Your Choice. Okay, so this is from the authors. One of the great things about being human is that we have the ability to make choices. Today's society is concerned about the liberty of individuals to decide for themselves. Everyone who has told their story in this book has made a crucial decision in their lives. For some, they have made their choice before their experience of death, others after their encounter with heaven or hell. We've added no comments to the stories as they speak for themselves, but as Christians, we believe it's vital people do think about where they will spend eternity. We believe that God created us as explained in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself. Male and female, he created them. We then learn and the Lord God formed a man's body from the dust of the earth and breathed into it the breath of life. And the man became a living person. It's interesting to note that the chemical components of the human body are exactly the same chemical elements as the dust of the ground. Our physical bodies are made up of about 17 chemical elements, the same 17 that are found in the dust of the ground. It is a matter of common observation that after a body has been cremated, only dust remains. It appears from reading these first two chapters of the Bible that the creation of the human body was a two-part process. First, of all the spirits of Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and then these spirits were breathed by God into a human body, formed of the dust to the ground. It follows, therefore, that we too are flesh made of the same chemical elements as the dust of the earth, but containing an eternal spirit. At death, the human body decomposes, but the spirit, which is un indestructible, lives on. And the point is, where are you going to live on? Are you going to live in heaven or hell? Right. This means that the real you is a spirit that will live forever. When the physical body dies, our spirit will live on and go either to heaven or hell. Both of these places have been described quite graphically in many of the stories and no doubt you have already decided that hell is not where you want to finish up. You might ask what evidence there is to support the ideas of heaven and hell contained in these accounts. There are many verses in the Bible which tell us about both. John 14, 2 tells us that heaven is where God lives. In Luke 15, 7, we read that heaven is happy when someone turns to God and asks forgiveness for their sins. In the book of Revelation, there are many verses which describe how wonderful heaven is, especially in chapters 21 and 22. These describe a new world where there is no crying, no sadness, no pain. Here the streets are pure gold, as clear as glass, and the walls are made of beautiful gems. By contrast, hell is described as a place of eternal torment and pain where the body suffers. This is shown most clearly in the story that Jesus told in Luke 16, 19 to 31. A poor beggar named Lazarus died and was taken by the angels to be with Abraham. Uh, in his lifetime, Lazarus used to beg outside the house of a very rich man, but he was given nothing by the man of the house. This rich man also died and was buried and his soul went into the place of the dead. There he was in torment, torment, desperate for water and begged Abraham to have pity on him. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in anguish in these flames. But Abraham told him that during his time on earth, he had everything and given Lazarus nothing. Between himself and Lazarus, the rich man was told was a great chasm and there was no way that anyone could cross over it. This story shows most clearly that once we have died, the decision taken on this earth regarding our eternal destination, heaven or hell, is final. You may never have the opportunity, as the people in this book have, to glimpse what lies beyond the final frontier of death. But you have read about their experiences. We cannot prove or disprove what they have seen. We can say, however, that what they have seen is confirmed by what Jesus told us while he was here on earth and what God revealed to other writers in the Bible. There is only one way to make certain that heaven is our destination when we die. We have to follow the ways and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, the Bible tells us in John 3.16, to die on the cross. If we believe this, accept God's forgiveness and decide to follow Jesus, then we are assured of eternal life in heaven. If we reject the forgiveness that God offers us, then we are turning away from him and we remain sinners. The Bible tells us very clearly in that same verse that eternal separation from God will be the result of this action. And that means you're going to hell. Romans 3.23 says that we are all sinners in God's sight because we have broken his commandments. God is holy and pure and sin cannot exist in his presence. The only way to God is to say we are sorry for the things in our life and accept the forgiveness offered to us. Jesus promises that he will accept us just as we are. Listed below are six simple steps that you can take to become a Christian and be certain of eternal life. Number one, first admit that you have lived selfishly and in not honoring God, you are a sinner and separated from him. That's in Romans 3.23. Number two, say you are sorry and ask him to forgive you for all those things in your life that you know are wrong. It's in Luke 13, three. Number three, tell God that you believe Jesus died on the cross in order to take away your sins and that you want him to come and guide your actions and your life. John 3, 16. Number four, tell other people that you believe Jesus is the son of God and that not only did he die for you, but that God resurrected him from the dead. Romans 10, nine. Number five, pray simply, dear God, I know that I have sinned and need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus, your son, died for all sinners, including me. Please forgive me as I forgive all those other people who have done wrong to me. I ask you to become the Lord of my life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Help me to live a life pleasing to you. Number six, you now have a new start. Do not depend on feelings as proof of your acceptance by God. Feelings are changeable, but your relationship with God is based on his promises. Take time for daily prayer and Bible reading. And here's some verses you can read. Romans 10, 13, Matthew 10, 32, 1 Peter 2, 2, Psalms 37, 4 and Romans 8, 14. So that's from the authors of this book, The Final Frontier. That's just to start us off. But it's a very exciting book because it really uh, give, goes through uh, people that have been... Uh, taken to either heaven and hell. So today's one that I want to read is called The Soldier, the story of Reverend Jerry Delaney from Kentucky in USA. As a platoon sergeant in Vietnam, I was organizing the setting up of an ambush in the bean fields, about 150 yards from the jungle line, when all of a sudden a man came towards me out of the jungle. He had a weapon on one shoulder and on the other a sack in which to collect supplies for the Viet Cong. I felt an overwhelming sense of power. I could either wound him or take his life. I and another of my platoon opened fire and the man went down. As an American soldier, I had been trained to objectify people so that you are killing a thing and not a person. We were also told to take the property of the enemy when they were dead. So in the near darkness, I went across and took the wallet out of his pocket and slipped it into mine. The following morning, one of my fellow soldiers asked me what I'd collected the previous evening. Having forgotten about it until then, I put my hand into the pocket of my trousers and pulled out the wallet I had removed from the man, my own wallet. About two weeks earlier, some 25 miles north of Saigon, the 199th Light Infantry Brigade, of which I was part, were working in the jungle villages in this area. I was leading one of the several units through the jungle. The area into which we were moving was waterlogged and the water was getting deeper and deeper. Eventually, I called back to one of the other officers that we needed to change direction because the water was getting too deep and we could become sitting ducks. At this point, the foliage of the jungle had become almost impenetrable. So one of the men, Bill Woods, who had a machete, hacked his way through the wall of bamboo ahead of us. I followed him through, but after about 10 paces, he stopped, turned around to me and whispered that he thought we had walked into an ambush. The Viet Cong were heading towards us in a U-shape and we were to the front and side of Bill and myself, the rest of the platoon having quickly moved backwards behind the thick curtain of bamboo. By now, Bill and I were up to our chins in water and suddenly he stumbled and went under the water, leaving me on my own. I later discovered that he had quickly dived and swum under the water. There was a big log in the water and as I went over to the other side of it, I, I startled a Viet Cong soldier who was hiding there. Then automatic fire started and I thought I would try and trick them into thinking I was dead. 
I decided to hold my breath and go into the water, making sure I came to the surface face downwards. However, when I tried to do this, I discovered my feet were entangled in the roots. And if that was not bad enough, I had a 40, 80 pound rucksack on my back. At that moment, the Viet Cong threw two grenades into the water and it was as if somebody had turned out the lights. Suddenly, everything got really black, dark, but I sensed that I was standing in my uniform, all neatly pressed and cleaned and carrying no weapon or rucksack. Ahead of me was a long, long path and on either side there were fields and fields as far as the eye could see of sunflowers. The colours of the flowers, yellow, brown, green, were set against the most beautiful blue sky I had ever seen. There were no clouds, just a huge expanse of brilliant blue. I could not see where I was, but as I looked down the path, I could see at the end of it a small light. My whole attention was taken up by it as I watched. It zoomed down the trail towards me. Never in all my life had I seen such brightness. It is impossible to describe. It was as if the light captured me. I could not take my eyes off it and I became enveloped by it. Gradually, I became aware of a presence at my right hand side. I did not turn and look, but I knew there was something there and somehow from within me came the thought, please don't take me, I'm not ready to go. Nothing had been said about me dying, but I knew that was what it was about. Then thoughts of my mother came into my mind. I had a distant relative who had been killed in Vietnam and I knew the effect it had had upon the family. My mother could not handle my death, I thought. As I stood there, still enveloped by de uh, as I stood there, still enveloped by this light, I heard a voice saying, "Do not be afraid. Everything is all right." That voice came from the right-hand side of me, and as I heard those words, I experienced a feeling of unconditional love spreading from the top of my head and down to my toes. Then came the voice again, he's not ready yet, you can take him back. I felt my right hand being taken by this presence, then instantly I woke up. I was lying on the ground and all the men of my platoon were standing or kneeling around me. The officer in charge was pressing with both hands on my chest. I began to cough and spit up water and he said in a stunned voice, are you okay? My response was, I think so. He asked me what had happened. I told him what I'd experienced but said I really didn't know. One of the other men chimed in, they threw grenades at you. Another said, Sergeant Delaney, if you keep on like this, we'll begin to believe in that God that you keep talking about. I told the officer I would recommend him for a Silver Star bravery reward when we got back to base because he had risked his life to get me to safety. He looked at me totally bewildered and said, but I never touched you. Thinking he was being modest, I told him he had pulled me back because I had felt his hands dragging me from the water. You've got it all wrong, he said. I plunged into the water, but I couldn't get close to you because of all the bullets. And then there was a huge explosion. By then you had disappeared and I thought we had lost you. All of a sudden though, your hand came up out of the water and you were right here in front of us. I could hardly believe it. Obviously it wasn't him, but if he hadn't come through the water to get me, then there was only one other answer. It was God's hand that had miraculously brought me through the root filled water and back to safety. Standing up, I fastened my clothes and we went on again and moved to a new location. Prior to this incident, I had for some unknown reason taken my wallet out of my trouser pocket and put it in my shirt. As I dressed, I checked my shirt pocket, but the wallet was gone and I knew there was no way of getting it back. It was probably lying in the bottom of the water where I'd gone down. Two weeks later, we were back in the same bean fields, 150 yards from the edge of the jungle. When I opened up my wallet, I discovered the money had gone and the photographs of my family had been put in that section of my wallet. In their place were photographs of a Vietnamese family. I cannot clearly describe my feelings at that moment when for the first time it struck me that I was killing people. This man I had killed was a family man just like me. His family would now be grieving for him. The senselessness of war hit me. All this man was doing was trying to chase me out of his country. I had great difficulty in balancing the near death experience I had only just gone through when I had experienced such unconditional love and then killing another human being. I did not know how I could continue in Vietnam. About a week later, during very heavy fighting, I was shot and lost most of my right arm. 
They sent me home to an American hospital to recover physically, but I suffered terrible post-traumatic stress, trying to make sense of it all. In fact, for a few years, I was convinced I was going mad. No one I knew had ever had an experience like mine, and I had certainly never read anything about it. I had been brought up as a Christian, married in a church, even led a church for a while. After Vietnam, I went back to college and got a degree in psychology and then went on to study counselling. So deep was the trauma I had been through, however, that eventually my marriage broke up and I had to go to counselling for myself. The man asked me what I was troubled by and as I tried to tell him, we both sat and wept. It was the beginning of my return to sanity. It was in 1975 I read a story in the Reader's Digest about a lady who had a near-death experience and the relief I felt was unbelievable. I was not going mad. It really had happened to me. One great thing I have learned from all of this is that our God is compassionate and always there to forgive. We do not have to be perfect, just repentant. And God is there to pick us up and use us for his glory. And the postscript on this story is the Reverend Jerry Delaney is a qualified, qualified psychologist and works in a practice, but is also part of a church pastoral team. OK, so there is somebody who is rescued uh, by the heavenly realm uh, in Vietnam. And, um, you know, God's grace was there for that man. So, folks, heaven and hell is real. If you want to go to heaven, you must believe in Jesus, that he died for you and rose again. And you need to ask God to forgive you of your sins. It's very simple. Please choose heaven. I want to see you there. I want to have fun with you there. I want to be there with you. Uh, I'm going there. I'm born again. I'm a new creation in Christ. You can be too. Just ask the Lord to um, forgive you of your sins and believe in Jesus that he died and rose again for you because he did. It's all real. All the rest is lies. Heaven is, re heaven is real and I want to see you there. So just ask God, just pray that the Lord God, please reveal yourself to me, show me your love and Lord, um, make sure that I do not pass from this earth until I'm born again. All right, God bless you for now. Uh, you can find this book, by the way, on yeshuasquare.com. It is a free copy of it there. If you go to the shop and go to eBooks, you can download a free copy of it. All right, God bless you, enjoy it. Bye for now.